Good morning, and welcome back to our study through the Gospel of John. We are working our way into chapter 2, uh, having exhaustedly completed our, uh, our look at John chapter 1. Last week we spent our time really focusing in on the contrast between what we saw in chapter 1 uh, in the ministry of John the Baptist and then in chapter 2, some of the things that we will encounter as Jesus' ministry begins to go public, uh, and we encounter him in Cana at the wedding feast. And you'll recall with me that the town of Cana was a small village in, uh, in Galilee that's been lost to history. We don't know exactly where it was, but it was very close, it seems, to Nazareth, uh, which was Jesus' hometown, of course. And we find at the wedding feast here in, in chapter 2 that Jesus, not only is Jesus and his, or Jesus and his disciples there, but also his, his mother Mary is there and his half-brothers are there. And so it, it wouldn't have been a long, a long distance to travel from Nazareth to, uh, to Cana. Uh, perhaps they were family acquaintances or perhaps they were even distant relatives of one sort or another that uh, that and, and that was the reason and explains why Jesus family shows up in Cana as well um, okay so the last thing we did last week was we began to take a look at what what a typical first century Jewish wedding uh, observance might look like and we talked about the fact that they would have a, a betrothal period of up to a year um, but that this betrothal was very, very um, serious business. It involved a real commitment, and that for all intents and purposes, except for the fact that they didn't live together, the married couple, or the engaged couple, the betrothed couple, was treated as if they were already married. And in fact, if you wanted to separate from this relationship, it required a formal legal divorce at that point. There were, there were formal um, agreements made in order to enter into a betrothal as well. Uh, we also talked last week about the highly significant spiritual nature of marriage in ancient Israel. We talked about the fact that there were linkages to the idea of being forgiven of their sins, um, that there was, uh, there was often a period of fasting preceding a marriage, there was a period of confession of sin, there might be a mikvah, uh, the, the Jewish bath that was associated with the forgiveness of sin and so those uh, and, and rebirth into the nation those were some of the principles that were involved in uh, in Jewish weddings but in addition to that that a Jewish wedding symbolized the relationship between the nation of Israel and God their father and so um, it's not unusual that we read later in the New Testament when, when Paul is writing particularly, uh, we read about the, the relationship of Christ to his church being like uh, that of a husband and a wife. And so to, to Hebrews, to Jewish people, uh, that would be a very easily understood concept because they were used to that. They always viewed um, uh, they always viewed marriage as symbolizing the relationship of God with his nation of Israel. Okay, now let's uh, move on from the actual uh, betrothal to the wedding event. And the wedding event would begin with a highly celebratory processional where the bride was led from her home from the, the house in the home she had grown up in, uh, she would be led to that of the groom's family. And along the way, anybody who met that processional was required um, to join into the processional. Even if you were going to a funeral, if there was a funeral procession that intersected with a wedding procession, everybody went to the wedding first. And what that tells us is the tremendous priority that these events took. Uh, if, the, if a wedding feast was happening, that was the most important thing in town that day, period. There was, there was nothing else that would, that would uh, upstage it. And so um, every, anybody who encountered the bride on her wedding day, and this, is, this might still be true, uh, but anybody who encountered the bride was obliged to offer compliments to her. Um, and, and those are actually formal requirements of, of uh, Jewish society. Once she arrived at the home of, of the groom's family, she was taken 
to join her husband to be uh, and at that time then there were formal verbal agreements made and something like this was usually said take her according to the law of Moses and Israel okay after that they would sign legal documents those documents would usually include some mention of whatever dowry was brought into the relationship um, and how the husband would then commit to support his wife uh, traditionally a husband would increase the dowry uh, the, the goods that would be at his wife's discretion to use in running the household uh, he would increase the dowry by at least 50 percent um, and if if she was from the upper reaches of of society if she was from a priest family then typically that number would be more like a hundred percent he would have to double the dowry so there there's a little bit of uh, class favoritism going on here in what they do but uh, the important for, thing for us to see, I think, again, is that there's just a very strong emphasis upon the legality of this, and the and it was codified in very specific uh, practices. Okay. Um, following the legal aspect being completed, there would be a ceremonial washing of hands, and then prayers would be offered, and the uh, the couple would be uh, blessed. After which, they would move into the marriage supper, and the marriage feast would begin. Uh, sometime later in the evening, the friends of the bridegroom would lead the groom and his uh, bride to the marriage chamber, uh, where ultimately, of course, the, uh, the marriage would be consummated. The feasting that had started would continue for up to a week at times. Um, and this, so, so not only was this a great celebration and the most important event in town, it was something that lasted for a while too. So we don't know a lot of the details about what happens here in chapter two. Uh, John the Apostle doesn't give us a whole lot of a, a lot of those details, but what he does do is he gives us some very important details as to Jesus' behaviors and what Jesus does. And we see it from several different perspectives. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a minute just to read through these, these 11 verses. Um, and then we're going to start analyzing this event from a different set of eyes each time. So we'll, we'll go through the narrative from the standpoint of each witness and uh, what they saw and what they experienced. So we'll kind of start on the outside of the circle and work our way into the middle. Okay, so here's, here's what uh, John the Apostle records from that day. He says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. And his mother said to his servants, said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the wine that had been, I'm sorry, tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Okay. So we are going to look at this event from various perspectives. And we're going to start, number one, with the guy we're going to call the banquet master. Okay. And he's like a master of ceremonies. He's the guy who's just coordinating the distribution of the, the food, the partying, uh, who's going to talk when, all those kind of events. He's, he's the MC. Um, 
interestingly, he seems to be unaware of the crisis. He doesn't seem to know that, it's, that there's been a problem even. And he certainly doesn't know anything about Jesus' intervention. Verse 9 tells us specifically that he did not realize where it had come from, where the wine had come from. So he specifically is, uh, John specifically records that. And instead, he goes ahead and he commends the bridegroom for having saved the higher quality of wine until later. Well, you know, you ask yourself, if you're facing the kind of problem that they're facing where the wine has run out or is running out, what are you going to do? Well, the natural response is you dilute everything that's left over and you start diluting before it's all gone. You know, and so that would be the natural response. But what the master of the banquet tells us is that that isn't what happened here. Because he specifically says what was served later was the best stuff. Okay, and so we need to get inside the Apostle John's head. He's trying to build a case here that Jesus' miracle was real. And so this is one of the ways he does it. He uses the banquet master's comments to ask, help us ascertain that indeed this was true high quality wine produced from the water. It was not something that had been watered down and just made to spread out amongst the crowd that was there. It's interesting that the Apostle John specifically mentions that the banquet master was unaware of Jesus' action. And what's the, what's, why? Why does John the Apostle mention that? Well, because it makes the banquet master's comments more credible. Because of the fact that he didn't know that Jesus had intervened at all, his comments served to really reinforce the fact that Jesus had done a genuine miracle and produced high quality wine. He was a more objective witness. If somebody who had seen the miracle occur, tasted it, their judgment might be a little slanted. But the banquet master had no knowledge of it. His comments were without knowledge of the shortage or the knowledge of what Jesus had done. And so it, it just reinforces that this stuff was better than the first stuff, the stuff that Jesus made. Okay, so that's what we can learn from the banquet master, and that's how the Apostle John uses the banquet master to build his case. Secondly, let's take a look at this event from the perspective of the servants that were there. We don't know how many servants there were, but unlike the banquet master, they saw the whole thing unfold. They knew what happened. They knew what Jesus had done. They knew you know, and, and we don't know exactly how Jesus did it. Did he pray over the vases? Did he touch them? Uh, did he say anything? We don't know the answer to that. But um, these servants saw all of that. And unlike the banquet master, they saw it unfold and they participated in it. It's interesting that they were told by Mary, um, do whatever he tells you. And it makes you think that maybe she had some special pull in this, in this family and in this household. Were they indeed relatives, perhaps? Um, could they have just been very dear friends? And Mary was in and out of the house frequently, and so the servants would respond to her as um, a surrogate for their actual masters. So is, is that a possibility? Well, of course, we don't know. But the servants witness three important details that John records. First of all, John records that this was a huge quantity of water. Okay? Um, there are six stone water jars, and each one holds, and the, the measurements here are variable, but it's thought that, that each one was holding somewhere in the range of 20 to 30 gallons. So, if you do the math, that comes out to be 120 to 180 gallons of water. Okay, we don't know if some of the water was already in these jars or if it or if they had to go draw at all. But I want you to put yourself in the in the in the body of one of those servants. And now this 
fellow says, go fill them up with water. And, and filling buckets with water, I'm sorry, fill, filling vases and jars with water was not like today where you can just go get the hose and, and run it in there. I mean, it meant a trip to the, to the source of water for the town in all likelihood, and they wouldn't be able to do that 120 or 180 gallons at a time. So they would have been traipsing back and forth carrying water buckets or something to deliver the water, or maybe they got an ox cart and put the jars on and took them there. But the point is, there's a lot of investment in this. There's a lot of work. And what's, what's it going to do? They're filling these jars with water. What is that going to accomplish? Not only does that seem foolish, it seems counterproductive. It's not going to get us good wine. And what's more, it's going to take us away from something that might be helpful. Okay, maybe there's something else we could do that would be helpful. So there's this huge, huge quantity of water. And again, what this is accomplishing is it has to help reinforce our minds as the witnesses and as and not, excuse me, as the readers, as the later uh, followers trying to decipher whether this le miracle is legitimate or not. And we see that because of this quantity, not only was this a miracle, it was a no doubter. Because it wasn't just a little jar full or a glass full of wine that they created. They created a huge supply of wine. Jesus did. And the, it, this, this quantity is important because it reinforces the size of the miracle. We often think of this miracle as being a little tiny doing. These servants would tell you it was much more than that. Okay? Now, there's a, remember I said there's three details that the apostle gives us. The first is the quantity. The second is that he says they filled the jars to the brim. This is in verse 7, okay? It says that they were filled to the brim. Why is that significant? Well, remember that these jars, it, it, the natural tendency would be to get something, some small amount of wine from somewhere, and put a little bit in, in each jar. Well, if you've got a 20 or 30 gallon tank and you fill it to the brim, you can't put very much food coloring in there or whatever drink you want to throw in there to have it diluted. It's full to the brim. You can't add something and trick the people. So there's another detail and a reason why we can believe the legitimacy of this miracle. And then the third detail that's important here is that they said, uh, they said these six stone water jars were the kind used for ceremonial washing. Now, if you knew the Jewish practices and the Jewish practices of ceremonial washing, what was in that jar in the past? And the answer was nothing but water because otherwise it would have been contaminated and could not have been used for ceremonial washing. So when they put all this water in there, it wasn't that there was this much wine left over in the bottom of the jar and now it's diluted. No, this was a ceremonial washing uh, vehicle and so it had to be clean from the beginning and it had nothing but pure water in it. And we can, we can know that for sure. So these servants, they serve as witnesses, and John uses them as eyewitnesses to validate the legitimacy of the story, the legitimacy of this miracle that occurred there, okay? One other thought about these servants that were present, and that is to think about the scope of this miracle. Most of Jesus' miracles were very public and performed with crowds around, but this one appears to be very private. And as far as we know, the only people who see this are, of course, Jesus, Mary, his disciples, and these servants. And they're, they're amongst the only ones who are really aware of what happened here. And in fact, it makes you wonder if, if they told anybody or not. Or maybe when John wrote this down at the end of the first century, this was the first time anybody had ever heard about this event. You wonder. And, and, of course, that's one of those questions we'll have to ask later on. Nobody knows. But it's possible, because of its private nature, it's possible that this miracle 
wasn't even really disseminated and wasn't made public. Why is that maybe significant or important? Well, because if Jesus had told everybody or made it obvious to everybody what he did, what happens to the bride and groom on their wedding day? They've just been upstaged. And it's a good thing to be upstaged by Jesus, but that's not in Jesus' character. And we can see Jesus' humility because of the fact that he does this instead in the back room with very few witnesses and in a private way, and he just is sure to get enough witnesses present that it can be recorded and its legitimacy can be verified, okay? So this shows us, from the, from the eyes of these servants, I think we can see Jesus' humility, the fact that he was doing this tremendous miracle, but not making it terribly public and certainly not upstaging the bride and groom, but also we, they see the kindness of Jesus. If, if this miracle had been made known, it would have been just as humiliating to the groom's family as if there was no miracle done. Because everybody would still know that the groom's family ran out of wine. And so it would have been just as humiliating. Okay, the third perspective that we're going to take a peek at here is that of Mary, Jesus' mother. And this is, this is really challenging for us to um, consider what Mary was dealing with, not just on this occasion, but what she'd been dealing with for 30 years. And trying to figure out what this son of hers was all about. Um, she has been living with this situation ever since Gabriel showed up and told her she would be with child like nobody else in human history and in a way, in a mechanism. But until now, they have lived uh, primarily in an out-of-the-woods town called Nazareth in rural Galilee, and nobody has really become aware of what's happening and what's brewing. Imagine the challenge that she had for all those years of trying to figure out Jesus' special calling. And she had, of course, better knowledge of him than anyone else. And we can see that in the way she approaches this day. I think for, I suspect that for Mary, the first indication in her mind that things were changing was that when Jesus came back from his visit to John the Baptist, when he came back now, he has disciples following him. Mary had to recognize that. Mary had to understand that something was changing. And I think it had to challenge Mary in wondering what's going to be next here. Are things going to just continue as they have been going, or is he going to start heading in a different direction? Okay? And so it's interesting to speculate why does she raise this crisis to Jesus? Does she really expect him to work a miracle? And that's, it's fair game. Um, nobody knows the answer to that. Was she aware of the power that he possessed? And I've, I've got some doubts about that, to be honest with you. Um, verse 11 tells us that this was the first of Jesus' miraculous signs. And so even though Mary had lived with him, um, and raised him, nonetheless, she did not understand what the Holy Spirit was going to do uh, in, in Jesus' life and how he was going to empower Jesus. He had received this demonstration of the Holy Spirit relatively recently at his, at his baptism. Um, there are some apocryphal stories of Jesus performing miracles as a child, uh, things like... Um, there are stories that he would uh, be down by the riverside playing and, and fashion a bird out of clay, and then the bird would fly away. But there's no verification or really no idea that any of those, those stories are anything more than fiction. Um, there's no, certainly no confirmation of those types of events. So we don't, we don't know exactly what, what Mary knew, but nonetheless she says, 
Uh, what is it specifically? She says, especially to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. What we can know for sure about this, we don't know if she knew he could perform a miracle, but what, she, what we do know was that she knew Jesus could take care of this situation in one way or another. Um, maybe he would be able to organize the servants to come up with a different solution. Uh, maybe they would be able to go buy some wine. Maybe they would be able to find some wine. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe there's some other rescue mechanism that, that she might have had in mind, or she just knew Jesus could come up with something. You know, I can imagine that as a, as a youth and then as a young adult, Jesus was undoubtedly a problem solver, and he fixed things for people. I, I, I just know that to be true, because he certainly did the rest of his life, too. Um, maybe he could provide special support to the bride and the groom in a non-threatening, non-humiliating way. Maybe, maybe he could say some things to the crowd that they would understand. But, but Mary, I'm sure, had the confidence in Jesus' ability to take care of the situation. Maybe it was Jesus and the disciples' fault that they ran out of wine. You know, um, when did they get invited? Were they last-minute invitees? We know that Jesus didn't have any disciples until just three days prior. And so if they were last-minute invitees, then maybe they just simply didn't order enough wine because Jesus and his buddies showed up. That's certainly a possibility as well. And so Mary was kind maybe Mary was kind of saying, you've kind of helped cause the problem, you need to help fix it. <laughs> um, at least those things are all possibilities. And so it's, it's interesting to think about in the mind of Mary what kinds of uh, what kind of a transition she's seeing take place in the ministry of Jesus. Okay, let's talk next about Jesus. Jesus himself. And I want to focus with Jesus, as we talk about Jesus, I want to focus on verse 4. And this is really the interaction between Jesus and his mother Mary again. And he says, I'll, I'll read it in the NIV. The NIV says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. But if you look at a more literal translation, it says something a little bit more, it's stronger. It says, Dear woman, what have I to do with you? Now, it almost sounds like Jesus is being disrespectful or he's rebuking his mother, but it's not. This is just, it's a common phrase, and that's why the NIV softens it when it, when it translates it um, away from that. And what this statement does tell us, though, is that Jesus and his mother are about to head on different paths now. There's a separation that's getting ready to occur. They're going to have different goals and different purposes, okay? You can remember something that happened, uh, it would have been about 19, 20 years previously. And this is recorded in Luke chapter 2. When the family was in Jerusalem, and Mary and Joseph started heading back towards home, but they didn't find Jesus. And of course, where was Jesus? Jesus was in the temple, and he was, he was interacting, both teaching and asking questions of, of the leaders of the day, uh, of the religious leaders. Um, and this, of course, is in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Okay? And at that time, when they finally found Jesus, you remember what Jesus had to say? Jesus said, don't you know that I had to be about my father's business? And so there's just been this undercurrent all along that there's a different set of priorities that Jesus is going to have to respond to. Okay, and, and it's hinted at all the way back there in Luke. But here in Cana, at this wedding feast, 
it rises again. And, and, and his mother, I'm sure, in listening to those comments, when Jesus says, what have I to do with you? She's saying, okay, this is, this is occurring. He's heading off on his mission. His mission is taking place. He comes back with disciples. Now he's, he's reminding me that he's got a different, a different place and a different mission. Jesus is literally cutting the cord. And their relationship is going to have to change. And he's now actively taking place. Uh, he's now actively starting to move into his ministry. Jesus then also says, my time has not yet come. And this is a phrase that John the Apostle will use throughout the rest of the book. Um, and it, it tells us, really, that Jesus is working off of a master plan. And what we're going to see is that in, I could give you all the verses, but let's just say this. In chapter 2, in chapter 7, and in chapter 8, Jesus says, it's not yet my time. Okay? But, starting in chapter 12, and again in chapter 13, chapter 16, and chapter 17, he says, my time is now. And so we see Jesus operating on this master plan, and he's got a laser focus on accomplishing the will of the Father. And that's going to be the purpose that he, that he is involved in from this day forward. And even at this early time, at this miracle in Cana, we can see that beginning to take shape when he says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And he's, he's thinking about the mission. He's thinking about the purpose. He's thinking about what he ultimately needs to do. Okay, we have one more group that we want to take a look at. These are the disciples. And ultimately, these are the ones for whom this miracle is intended. Okay? But we're going to call it quits right now, and we'll get into the disciples and what they saw and what their perspective was on this. We'll get into that next week. So I look forward to continuing our way, our journey through John chapter 2. Um, we've got another week or two yet uh, to look at this this miracle in Cana, um, and I hope that you are finding as it is uh, fascinating and interesting as, as I do, and ultimately faith lifting and faith building, because that is what the Apostle John intends for it to be. Okay, don't forget, God is good all the time.